Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with some literary practice. This is called Unplugged Vacation, Shake That Cell Phone Habit for a While. Ready? Here we go. A quiet morning in a New Hampshire inn. Over tea, we gaze through the window at two birch trees, letting relaxation wash over us. Our cell phones beeped, texts, emails, and social media posts threw us into work mode. We marveled at how quickly connecting electronically with the outside world shattered our calm. Today's digital devices enable us all to work ever more efficiently even during time off. According to a 2014 TripAdvisor survey, 77% of Americans work while on vacation. When a number of my patients go on vacation, their family makes them promise not to be on social media, says Sherman Oaks-based licensed therapist Dennis Palumbo. Most of the time, they violate the rules sneaking into the hotel bathroom at night to check email. Increasingly, however, people feel the need to disconnect. More than 100,000 people participated in this year's event, says Tanya Spetz, spokesperson for the National Day of Unplugging, which is sponsored by Reboot, an organization that affirms the value of Jewish traditions. Since 2010, the group has encouraged people to turn off digital devices on the first Sabbath in March from down, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Our goal is a balanced relationship with digital devices, says Sylvia Hart, executive director of the Center for Digital Wellness at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Vacations can be a perfect time to get a taste of that. Here are some tips for planning a digital light vacation. Designate someone at home to contact in an emergency. Let friends and followers know you'll be off the grid. Prepare. Have a conversation with your employer about not getting in touch with you. Hart says, and practice with mini unpluggings on weekends or evenings. Anticipate, have board games and puzzles on hand, she says, and have a place to hold everyone's digital devices. Tell the kids the phones are going on vacation too. But be reasonable, agree to check in online maybe once or twice a day, Palumbo says. A vacation can be stressful enough without the cold turkey stress. You'll probably You'll probably return from vacation more relaxed, as writer Anne Lamont says. Almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. All right, let's see what else we have. Let's try another literary. This is called Take a Deep Breath. When you're feeling stressed, do you catch yourself holding your breath? Travel can give us plenty of anxious moments, and the key to navigating them is proper breathing, says clinical psychologist Melissa Branch, author of Breathe, a Guide to Breathing Exercises. Stress leads to shallow breathing, and that causes the brain to pump out the stress hormone cortisol, thus creating a vicious cycle. Branch teaches people how to break it. You can calm your neuro neurological system in seconds by taking a good deep breath the right way, she says. When most of us breathe deeply, our shoulders rise on the inhale and fall on the exhale. Branch calls this vertical breathing. You can get a fuller breath by breathing from your diaphragm, horizontal breathing. Give it a try. Sit up straight with your back a few inches from the back of your chair. As you inhale, rocking forward, arching your back, tilting your pelvis, and letting your belly soften outward. As you exhale, rock back, curving your spine toward the chair and compressing your belly toward the spine. Horizontal breathing puts you in a relaxed state where your body and brain are better oxygenated. Taking two minutes for this breathing exercise several times during each travel day can reduce stress and even help you sleep better. some jury charge practice. Ready? Here we go. 
you must determine whether one of ordinary skill in the field reading the patent as of the date of the invention would understand what is claimed when the claim is read in the light of patent specification as a whole, even if one needs to experiment so as to determine the limits of the claims of the patent. That would not necessarily be a basis for holding the claims invalid. In order to obtain a patent, an applicant must first persuade the patent office and, more precisely, its examiner that the applicant invented a patentable invention. During the course of this period of negotiation between the applicant and the patent office, the applicant can provide information to the patent office in an attempt to demonstrate that the patent should issue, as one might expect for the patent office to determine intelligently whether a patent should issue. An applicant must disclose all of the information known to the applicant to be material to the patentability of the inventions claimed in the application. If the applicant ultimately obtains the patent but does so by either withholding material information from or by misrepresenting material facts to the patent office while possessing the intent to deceive the patent office, the patents are rendered unenforceable. To prove the defense of inequitable conduct, Roach must show that Dr. Lin or his representatives are, were aware of certain information that was material to the patentability of the claimed in inventions, but withheld that information from the patent examiner or submitted false information that was material to the patentability of the claimed inventions, and that they did so with the intent to deceive or mislead the examiner into allowing the patent both materiality and intent to deceive our independent elements each of which must be proven by clear and convincing evidence. Information is material if there is a substantial likelihood that a reasonable examiner would consider the information important in deciding whether to allow the application to issue as a patent. A reference, however, need not be disclosed to the examiner if it is merely cumulative of or no more material than other references already before the examiner. A reference that is actually submitted to the examiner cannot form a basis for inequitable conduct regardless of whether it is submitted alone or along with large volume of other references. In assessing intent, you should consider any evidence in indicative of good faith. Finally and importantly, the intent to deceive cannot be inferred solely from the fact that information was not disclosed. There must be a factual basis for a finding of deceptive intent. I will now explain to you the requirements of materiality and intent. I will then explain how you should balance any materiality and intent that you find in order for you to determine whether or not there was inequitable conduct in considering the issue of materiality. You must first determine whether or not information known to the applicant or his representatives was withheld from or misrepresentative misrepresented to the PTO. If you must find that Dr. Lynn, Mr. Borm, or others involved in a substantial way with the application withheld or misrepresented information when applying for the patent, you must then determine whether or not that information was material. Information is material if there is a substantial likelihood that a reasonable patent examiner would consider it important in deciding whether or not to allow the application to issue as a patent. In other words, information is material if it establishes either alone or in combination with other information that a claim of the patent application more likely than not does not meet one of the requirements for a patent, such as the requirements that a patented invention be new, useful, and non-obvious. Information is also material if it refutes or is inconsistent with arguments made to persuade the examiner that the invention is entitled to patent protection. Information is not material if it is cumulative of, that is, adds little to other information already available to the examiner. Information is cumulative if it teaches no more than that which is taught by the other information or are already before the patent office. Legal arguments characterizing references submitted by the patent applicant cannot rise to the level of inequitable conduct. Legal arguments are not material information for purposes of an inequitable conduct charge. To satisfy the duty of disclosure, the applicant need not explain to the examiner the relevance of a particular piece of prior art or otherwise take steps to ensure that the examiner actually considers those references that have been submitted. If you find that material non-cumulative information was not disclosed by a person having a duty of disclosure, you must next consider whether that person intended to mislead or deceive the patent and trademark office. If you find that material information known to the applicant or his representatives was withheld 
from or misrepresented to the patent examiner, then you must determine whether it was done with intent to deceive the patent office. Roach must prove intent to deceive the patent office by clear and convincing evidence, evidence relevant to the question of intent to deceive or mislead. The patent office includes any direct evidence of intent as well as evidence from which intent may be inferred. You may infer intent from conduct. That means you may conclude that a person intended the foreseeable results of his or her actions. You should decide whether or not to infer an intent to deceive or mislead based on the totality of the circumstances, including the nature of the conduct and evidence of the absence or presence of good faith intent to deceive cannot be inferred solely from the fact that information was not disclosed to the patent office. There must be a factual basis for a finding of deceptive intent where the only evidence of intent is a lack of good faith explanation for the non-disclosure. This cannot constitute clear and convincing evidence of an intent to deceive if you find that Roach has proved by clear and convincing evidence that material information was withheld from or misrepresented to the patent office and that there was an intent to deceive or mislead the patent examiner, you must then balance the degree of materiality and the degree of intent to determine whether or not the evidence is sufficient to establish clearly and convincingly that there was an equitable conduct. The higher of the materiality of the withheld or misrepresented information is the lower the intent needed to establish an equitable conduct and vice versa. Materiality ranges from an objective but for test where there was a misrepresentation that was so material that the patent should not have issued at the highest level of materiality to the reasonable examiner test as I previously explained to you at the lowest threshold. This is called How I Relearned to Drive. <clears throat> Ready? Here we go. Let's face it, most of us think of ourselves as younger than we really are. I'm no exception. I pictured myself in my mind's eye as a 35-year-old for well over a decade. Eventually, reality started to catch up. More and more gray hair showed up in the mirror. I lost a step or three on the tennis court and my arthritic knees felt incre increasingly creakier every morning. Now I'm 65 and feeling pretty comfortable inside my age-spotted skin, though on some days, I'm aspirin raises my comfort level a lot. Recognizing the signs of aging in the mirror or on the tennis court is merely a matter of vanity. Behind the wheel, it's a matter of safety and survival. Like many seniors, I plan on driving for a long time and I know that go doing so requires relearning along the way, adapting to the physical, perceptual, and mental changes that come with age. For me, the relearning process began long before I became eligible for Medicare. Here are some useful points to ponder. Dim the dash. In my 40s, I started to have trouble seeing well at dusk and at night. That's a normal process of aging, says Dr. Carl Seatek, chair of the American Optometric Association's Commission on Ophthalmic Standards. Our pupils get smaller as we age. Even at maximum dilation, they simply let in less light. For me, the problem started a little earlier than it does for most people, maybe because of the medication. Dimming the instrument panel helped a lot, and I've kept it a just visible brightness ever since. The technique works for the same reason that turning off a room light in your home lets you see out a window at night. The dashboard illumination causes scattered light inside the eyes, which just bounces around and doesn't contribute to a useful image, CTEC says. I also get obsessive about cleaning my windshield inside and out to improve nighttime visibility. Change specs. About the same time, glare from oncoming headlights became a real problem. 
especially on rainy nights. I tried all the usual tricks, such as glancing at the white edge lines on the right side of the road instead of looking straight ahead to avoid a direct assault on my eyes, but the big biggest improvement came after I ditched my contact lenses for eyeglasses with an anti-reflective AR coating explaining the science behind the switch, CTEX says, Uncoated spectacles allow 90 to 92% of light to pass through the lens. A good AR coated lens lets 98% or more of the light through, and that really makes a difference. Don't confuse AR coated lenses with the yellow anti glare specs hawked on TV and commercials. Saitek calls them the worst thing you can wear at night because they reduce the amount of light that reaches your eyes break a sweat. Now in semi-retirement, I make time to bike, play racket sports, and practice yoga, not because it improves my driving, but because it's fun and keeps my waistline from outgrowing my jeans. Even so, study after study has concluded that regular exercise improves a full range of skills necessary for behind-the-wheel performance, including a flexibility, strength, and importantly, in attention. In driving, you have to turn your head and neck when changing lanes, rotate your trunk when getting in and out of the car, grip the wheel when steering, and push the pedals when accelerating and braking, says Anita Lors Villa, manager and community affairs and traffic safety for the auto club. Exercise improves your ability to do all that and can improve your cognitive abilities too. Research has shown that as little as 15 to 20 minutes of exercise a day improves seniors' driving experience. Sharpen psyche, psycho, psychomotor skills. I admit my body has deteriorate, deteriorated over the years, but I've always believed my brain hasn't. I can still zip through the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzle in ink, and I learned a foreign language while in my 60s. Sure, I might forget an old acquaintance's name every now and then. Who doesn't? But my mind remains sharp enough to drive, no question. Or so I thought until I tried Drive Sharp, an online driving training program that purports to boost your ability to track moving objects, expand your useful field of view, and improve your reaction time, all basic safe driving skills. Drive Sharp plays like a video game. You take a cross country tour of national parks from Acadia in Maine to the Grand Canyon. Along the way, you have to visually track tomatoes, ice cream cones, watermelons, and other items flying off the back of a truck. Differentiate between vehicles that appear only for a split second and spot hazards in your peripheral vision. Every so often, you pause to assess your progress. Drive Sharp works by rewiring the brain through learning, literally changing the structure, function, and chemistry of the brain, explains neuroscientist Henry Mankey, CEO of Posit Science, the company that developed the training. This kind of learning is very much like learning to play a musical instrument, such as the piano. After a while, though, Drive Sharp feels less and less like a video game and more like, well, a piano lesson in which you hit a lot of sour notes. It isn't easy, but after several sessions, I managed to improve my reaction time and expand my useful field of view by more than 20%. I also jumped more than 50 percentile points in my ability to track multiple objects. One study from Post-it Posit Science showed that improving these attributes could translate directly to behind the wheel results. Seniors who did this type of training for two hours a week for five weeks showed a 48% decrease in at-fault crashes compared with an untrained control group. If you decide to take drive sharp training, don't rush it. It's better to limit the duration of each session and stretch out the sessions over several weeks. Set a goal and schedule and a schedule that fits into your week and stick to it. As a quipster once said, getting old stinks unless you consider the alternative. I feel the same way about relearning to drive, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes to stay behind the wheel and ensure my independence for as long as I can safely do it. If you share this goal, the prescription is clear. All of us have to keep relearning how to drive. more. 
jury charge practice. When you go to the jury room, you should first select one of your members to act as your foreperson. The foreperson will preside over your deliberations and will speak for you here in court. Members of the jury, you have decided to award punitive damages in this case. I will now explain to you the rules of law that you must follow and apply in deciding the amount of a punitive damages award. The charges I previously gave you regarding your duty to deliberate and consider the evidence still apply. I am now going to explain the law on the appropriate amount of punitive damages. You must determine the appropriate amount of punitive damages. In doing so, you should consider all the evidence in the first phase of the trial plus any evidence admitted in the most recent phase of the trial. You should also bear in mind that the plaintiff's injury has been made whole by your award of compensatory damages. When assessing punitive damages, you must be mindful that punitive damages are meant to punish the defendant for the specific conduct that harmed the plaintiff in the case and for only that conduct. For example, you cannot assess punitive damages for the defendant being a distasteful individual or business. Punitive damages are meant to punish the de defendant for this conduct only and not for conduct that occurred at another time. You on your only task is to punish and deter the defendant for the actions it took in this particular case. The amount you award should reflect these purposes only. In fixing the amount, you may consider the financial resources of the defendant. You may only award punitive damages in excess of $250,000 if you find that defendant acted with specific intent to cause harm. Therefore, if you award punitive damages in excess of $250,000, you must indicate on the jury verdict form whether you find specific intent to cause harm. Under the law, a party possesses specific intent to cause harm when the party desires to cause the consequences of its act or believes that the consequences are substantially certain to result from it. Intent may be shown by direct or circumstantial evidence, and intent is ordinarily ascertained from facts and conduct. You may not presume that defendant acted with specific intent to harm but you may find specific intent to harm upon consideration of the words conduct, demeanor, motive, and all the other circumstances connected with the alleged act. Your foreperson will continue to preside over your deliberations and will speak for you here in court. I have prepared a ver verdict form for you to complete regarding punitive damages. You will take the verdict form to the jury room, and when you have reached unanimous agreement, you will have your foreperson fill in the verdict form date and sign it, and then return to the courtroom. If you should desire to communicate with me at any time, please write down your message or question and pass the note to the marshal who will bring it to my attention. I will then respond as promptly as possible, either in writing or by having you returned to the courtroom so I can address you orally. I caution you, however, with regard to any message or question you might send that you should not tell me your numerical division at that time. We will stop there and that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.